The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to APS Webinars. The title of today's webinar is The Future of Physics in America, Effective Advocacy, Budget Cuts, and What You Can Do. I'm Crystal Bailey, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Today's presentation features graduate students Megan Comins and John Murgo and APS Office of Public Affairs staff Francis Flakey and Tyler Glimbo. They will be describing the effects of sequestration on the scientific community and sharing information on how you can get involved in advocating effectively for science funding. After our speakers have finished their presentations, the remainder of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. You may ask a question at any time during the broadcast. We will do our best to cover all of the questions that you submit, but we want to apologize if we're unable to cover everything. Finally, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after today's event. It will also be made available on this webinar's main page on the APS website. Uh, we encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. Now, I would like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. First, uh, joining us today is Francis Flakey, PhD physicist and associate director of public affairs for APS. He is a fellow of the APS, a fellow of the AAAS, and a MacArthur Scholar. He is also the first person in history to both summit the highest mountain on every continent and surf every major ocean, a global journey that is the subject of his best-selling adventure memoir, To the Last Breath. Also joining us today is John Murgo, a PhD student in physics studying soft condensed matter. John has been a successful advocate as author of an op-ed piece that stresses the importance of federal science funding. He has participated in congressional visit days and has been featured in APS News for his advocacy efforts. Next we have Megan Komen, a PhD student in astronomy studying planetary system evolution. Megan has served the community as the past chair of the Forum on Graduate Student Affairs. She has both participated in and helped set up multiple congressional visit days. And finally, we have Tyler Glimbo, a PhD physicist and government relations specialist for the American Physical Society. Before coming to APS, Tyler did his PhD in biophysics at Arizona State, studying how protein dynamics shape evolution and disease. And so now I think we're ready to get started. Uh, I think first up uh, as our presenter is uh, Flake, so uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. So everything we actually do in the Washington office derives directly from the APS membership, and that's all of you. We get our guidance from APS members on every APS advocacy issue, and we assist any APS member who wants to advocate for those issues. So we advocate on a variety of issues, uh, but the physics research budget is job number one of the APS Washington office. And we work on these other issues as well, but you know what, we plan future webinars that we're going to use to go into detail on some of these other issues like energy and environment, national security, and STEM ed. So instead, today, we're going to focus exclusively on the federal science budget. So let me describe briefly how we advocated for the federal science budget over the past year so you get a feel for what we do and how we work with APS members. So a year ago, Congress was determined to cut the federal science budget. And there was legislation to slash NSF funding by 8%, eliminate the James Webb Telescope, uh, cut DOE Office of Science budget by as much as 10%. If we didn't take action, if the community of physicists had stayed quiet, then those cuts would have gone through. In fact, uh, it's more likely the cuts would have even gotten worse. Because one thing about Congress, if they propose a cut and no one complains, then they cut even more. So the Washington office came up with a year-long strategy that employed 
every option that was available to us. The first thing we did is Mike Lubell and I started meeting directly with members of Congress and the congressional staff on key committees to lay out our concerns. Now, those direct meetings are essential, but what's really critical is that the members of Congress hear directly from the constituents, all of you. So um, we started an effort at the APS March meeting, continued it at the April meeting, where we deployed the largest congressional letter writing campaign in the history of APS. And by May of last year, more than 8,000 letters from APS members were delivered to Congress, and all of them were calling for reversing those proposed cuts that I mentioned. So those letters were supplemented with dozens of direct meetings by APS members with key senators and representatives and their staff. And you're going to hear more about that from some of the participants. And then at the same time, and you're going to hear more about this too, the Washington office worked with individual APS members to publish op-eds in the newspapers that are in the states and districts of key members of Congress. So for nine months, we had a full court press. We were direct lobbying, we were letter writing, we were doing grassroots advocacy, we were doing op-eds, and everything we did over those seven months delivered the exact same message, which was scientific research is vital to U.S. economic competitiveness, and the proposed cuts have to be reversed. Good news, at the end of December last year, um, the budget was released, it was finalized, and none of the proposed cuts uh, to science took place. In fact, science was up by almost a percent, almost $5 billion. So we were successful last year, but things are a lot harder this year as budgets are even tighter, which means that we need to get even more APS members involved. Now, you may have noticed something on this slide, and it's one name that keeps coming up again and again and again when it comes to mobilizing the APS membership, and the name is Tyler Glembo. And Tyler's job in our office is to help all of you speak with a powerful, effective voice to get things done in Congress. So I'm going to turn it over to Tyler. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my job, as Blake described, is to help the APS membership speak with a powerful voice. And one of the most important voices that we have is the student voice. Now, Students are very, very effective advocates when they go up to Capitol Hill, when they meet with their representatives, when they write into their representative, in all different ways. And today, we will be asking you as students to get involved. But before we actually talk about how you can be involved, I first want to introduce two of our students who have been involved and who have been very effective advocates. Uh, the first is John Murgo, and the second is Megan Commons. Uh, John will speak first. John has been involved in many different activities, and he'll describe to you both why he wanted to get involved and also how he's been involved and how that's been effective. So, John? So, thank you. So, what I'm going to talk about is why, how did I get started in science policy advocacy and you know how how it went for me um, so really the first thing that that started me on this path was a very important question that I got when I was doing my undergraduate degree in physics and it was one of my friends asking me this oh, there we go how does a physical scientist do anything helpful for society and when I heard that I didn't know how to answer but it wasn't because I had a lack of understanding of the question, I know a lot of different ways that physicists or chemists or engineers help society, but I couldn't believe that there was a disconnect between the research that's being done in laboratories and the technology and everyday products that people are using. So why, why would I care, or why would any of us want to care about this? Um, so for me, at least, this this is Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. This is where I was. This is where I was raised, and uh, most of you know Ohio as the state that has I-90 in it, which people use to go to Chicago from the East Coast. Um, but there's another reason why Ohio is important, and there's 12 million people there. Um, it's it's in the top 10 in population in the United States, and these people vote. So. When I'm going, when I'm talking to my friends and I'm getting a degree in physics and they ask me, what does a physicist have to do with helping society? What do they do that helps society? 
um, that's very really important because the people that these people are electing um, are, are essentially defining what your budget is going to be as a research, research scientist. Um, so you can think of uh, advocacy as how do we, how do we show them where, that science is everywhere? How do we show them that science is very important to their everyday life? Um, and the first thing you always hear when you're an undergrad in science is get involved in outreach. Outreach is very important. And so here I'm showing you a picture on the left from the Ohio State Fair where we're showing uh, people who come into this demonstration what 250 watts of power is. Like if you plug in a light bulb, how much power is that? And this kid is trying to pedal a bike that's connected to 250 watts and he's not succeeding. So it's a demonstration in how much energy that actually is, how much power that is. And the guy on the right is uh, one of my friends who uh, was taught by our advisor to gargle liquid nitrogen and blow condensation trails out of his nose. But this was an outreach thing designed to show people, like everybody, everybody is used to what very hot things are, but what happens if a very cold thing touches you? What happens if a very cold thing, what if you ingest very cold things? And the point of these outreach things is to show kids that math and science isn't just a hard subject, and it's also to show adults the fundamental science behind common technology that, that they use in their everyday life. Um, but the problem with these types of outreach events is that everybody likes the 30 second explanations of sciencey stuff, especially if there's an explosion behind it or in front of it. Um, so if you're looking at educating the populace for your, your science budget, um, you could also think of doing education itself. Like if you're going to advocate for science, what about going and educating people directly? And this is something that I tried to get involved with. And here's me having a great time teaching fourth graders in Harlem, New York about density. And it was a cute little lab. They got cups of water and cups of maple syrup and sugar water, and they mixed them together and watched them separate into different layers. What's not in this picture is that I had no real control over what was going on. Um, if you could imagine when you were in second grade or fourth grade, as, as I was in fourth grade, um, if I had a substitute teacher, that meant it was time to goof off. And I actually did have kids eating the maple syrup and the sugar. And, um, so maybe this isn't the right place for a scientist to, to try to do outreach. But here in New York, it's policy that determines that the kids have face time with a scientist. So if we want to have a change in the way that science is, uh, so that the rules and regulations and funding for science, why don't we try to talk to the policymakers themselves? And this is where I got involved with the uh, APS, uh, thanks to Megan Commons, who will be presenting later. And I joined up for congressional visit days. And so one thing I learned, um, there's a big difference between kids and policymakers, and it's that the policymakers will actually listen to you. So there's also a list of very important reasons to talk to the government officials, and the first of which that we've said over and over again is funding. But it's not just your funding. Um, chances are that the funding that, or chances are that the government has funded research that, if not your own, research that you build off of or, or products that came from research that you're using in your labs. They are also representative of their districts, which means if people in their districts don't understand the connection between science and technology and, and products that they use or their everyday life, then it's, it's possible that the representatives won't either. And they can't be on top of everything. So if there are people proposing that they have budget cuts in certain areas uh, and the scientists don't come in and talk about why those budget cuts are devastating to the labs, they're not going to know that information. And finally, the... Um, Congressional members and staff are very receptive of hearing scientists' opinions and information about what's going on. So when I did this, I've done this for two years now, and it, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I realized that I made a somewhat of a difference, or I like to think that I did, and it's with the office of uh, Representative Gibbs from Ohio. Um, in 2011, I went in to talk to him, and he was a new Republican elected in 2010, so his, his priority was to cut uh, spending as much as possible. And this was during the uh, summer where we had the national debt crisis, so you know how, uh, how the cuts were going at that point. And so when I talked to his science staff, we, we discussed the on-the-table budget, uh, on, on budget cuts for the civilian research institutions, and 
um, what that would actually do for young scientists, like what that would, would do for me in terms of my funding and where I would be having to look for funding later, and as well as the fact that I was funded partially through a, a fellowship from Saudi Arabia. And when I came in the following year, I ended up to, uh, speaking to the same person, and we had a much more cordial conversation because now they knew who I was, they knew my story, and we had a better, uh, better rapport with each other. And then also had the chance to thank him for supporting a, bo a slight boost to the science budget, which is what we were not expecting the previous year. And I have a similar story with uh, the senator from the same state. Um, where I actually walked in and they were interested in hearing about my current work and then finally when we left uh, he told me it's nice to have scientists come in because you, they don't see them on the hill that often. So what I'd like to do now is have this turned over to Megan who will talk to you more about the specifics of congressional visit days. Uh, thank you. Just one second here. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is basically the mechanics of what happens when you talk to congressmen, what my experience has been, and what I have learned. So what actually happens in a congressional visit? Basically, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the members of the congressional office, and you get to talk about the impact of legislation, not just on your life, but on the lives of your colleagues, your advisor, science in the country in general, the district, the state. Uh, it's pretty far-reaching. And it really is a two-way discussion. Uh, as John said, you know, they, they care about what you have to say. They ask for your opinion. They want to know more about the facts and numbers that you bring up. They, they really do care about what you have to say. And the people you meet with are the offices in Congress for the states and districts where you're a constituent. You, you're not going to meet with an office where you don't have a connection because you don't really know that district or state very well and um, constituents are who is important to them. Now, usually the person that you'll meet with is a staff member who's in charge of like science and energy issues, also known as the science staffer. And in the Senate, you're very likely to be meeting with the staffer and not the senator. Uh, and in the House, it's pretty much the same, but sometimes you can get to meet with the representative in person, which is uh, really fun. Uh, now, I have various connections with four states uh, that I've lived in since 2003, because I grew up in Michigan, went to college in Ohio, and I've been in grad school in Pennsylvania and New York. And how I got involved with this is a random email from a fellow grad student at Penn State who was heavily endorsing uh, being involved with Congressional Visits Day with the American Astronomical Society. So after that, uh, I've participated in Congressional Visits Days for three years now. Um, first in 2010, I focused specifically on Pennsylvania, and I visited in a relatively small Congressional Visits Day with some APS unit officers. And before going in, I was kind of worried the meeting would be awkward or like talking to a brick wall, that it might be kind of a waste of my time um, or that I might just not communicate very well. But afterwards, I realized it really wasn't awkward at all. I wasn't the only person in the meeting. Uh, and it was obvious that, that they did care about what I had to say, so I was really motivated to come back and talk to them again the next year. And so in 2011, the APS agreed to fund four grad students uh, to go to the larger Congressional Visits Day. So there's me on the left and John, the previous speaker, in the middle. And the other two people who went are Carl Firkenhoff, who's a fellow astronomy grad student in my department from Minnesota on the right, and Zach Lamberty, who is a Cornell physics PhD student who is from South Dakota. He's not in the picture. Uh, and this was really important Congressional Visits Day because it was the day before the, the quote-unquote debt limit showdown, and it had a lot of serious consequences for science that were already discussed by Dr. Slakey and mentioned by John. And I chose to, because this was pretty important. I chose to uh, visit offices from all four of the states that I had lived in recently, and the four of us together visited Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, New York, South Dakota, and Minnesota. But then uh, in 2012, I decided to focus on building stronger connections in my home state of Michigan, uh, and I just made sure to thank those who supported us uh, the previous year, uh, especially the offices that didn't seem very supportive. Instead of just going in and asking for help with no acknowledgement of any previous actions, so it doesn't just seem like we're just coming in and asking for things and asking for things without building an actual relationship. And what I've learned over the past couple of years is, first and foremost, as I've said lots of times and you've heard a bunch of times, is Congress will listen to you. Support for science is really bipartisan, even if it might be portrayed differently. And as a constituent, you are extremely important to them. Your opinion is the most important. 
Um, second, the impact of, soci of science on society is really enormous. I, that might seem kind of like an obvious statement, but like John mentioned, it, it really isn't. And figuring out ways to communicate just how big the impact is is really or was really eye-opening for me. Uh, it kind of gave me a sense of place for where I am in society as a whole. And, and related to this, the way that you deliver a message is at least as important as its content. Uh, so a really good example of this is various perceptions, perceptions of the phrase basic scientific research. We see that as research that is early stage, not applied, but a lot of people in the country see the word basic as opposite of difficult. So when you ask for support for basic research, it sometimes sounds like you're asking for support for easy research. And so thinking about these sorts of things really helps you just become a, a better communicator with the uh, public as a whole. And something incredibly important is to not be biased by, your own, by, by my politics or your own politics. And as an example, Carl met with uh, Representative Michelle Bachman's office because he's from her district in 2011, and it was his best meeting that year. There are a lot of people who disagree with her politics, you know, and agree, but a lot of people who disagree seem to think that meeting with her office would be a waste of time, that she wouldn't listen at all, but it really isn't like that. Because even if you don't agree with a member of Congress uh, and their politics, every office is staffed by really intelligent people who do care about what you have to say, and they use your information to inform uh, the senator or representative and to help them make decisions. Now, you can't help with this. Uh, a lot of uh, people I talk to who are interested in this feel like it's kind of a, a black box and hard to get involved with this, but it, it's really not. Um, and especially, you know, people like, well, early career scientists and engineers like me and uh, like you. So undergrads, grad students, recent graduates with bachelor's, master's, or PhDs, postdocs, um, pretty much anyone who's early in their career. Um, so why you? I mean, you're, you're part of an up-and-coming, highly skilled workforce. Uh, and your, your opinion is particularly valuable in explaining the impact of science in society. I mean, you, you're the one who is going to be seeking a job soon and taking leadership roles. And so they're interested in hearing what you have to say. So what can you do? How can you get involved with this? So uh, one of the easiest ways is to give your opinion to Congress through letters or petitions. So you might see some emails come through the APS or other professional societies sometimes, and you might hear, and you will hear about this a little bit later, um, to give your opinion by joining a group and, and stating a group opinion through a letter or petition. That's a really good way to get involved in an easy, non-time consuming way. Uh, you can attend a Congressional Visits Day through a professional society. Uh, John and I have gone through the APS, but Congressional Visits Day is a huge deal every year, and it's not just the APS. For example, there's also the American Chemical Society, Material Research Society, IEEE Society, American Geophysical Union, American Astronomical Society. There's lots of professional scientific societies that are involved. Um, you could apply for Congressional Science Policy Fellowship uh, if you currently have a PhD or will have a PhD. Uh, one of the biggest ones is through the AAAS, um, but the APS and various other professional societies also have congressional internships. Uh, and you can even meet with your local representative in your home district. For example, it's pretty easy to hear to do that in Ithaca because Representative Hinge's office is just downtown. It's, it's less than a 10 minute bus ride away from campus. So there are lots of things that you can do, and if you want to get involved with meeting with Congress and you want to do it through a professional society, uh, contact someone in that society, uh, like talk to Tyler and try to find out how you can help. Uh, because volunteers are usually pretty much always welcome. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it on to Tyler, uh, and thanks. Thank you very much, Megan. So I'm going to transition a little bit and remind you again, first off, as Megan and John both pointed out, that the student voice is incredibly important. So in terms of how important your voice is, to make this interactive, we are putting together a student sequestration letter, where today you have the chance to let Congress know that sequestrations are 
very potentially damaging to our futures as scientists, engineers, technological innovators. And here is the link to this letter. And it's very short. You can quickly read through it. And as you're reading through it, I'm going to go through and give you a little bit of background regarding what sequestrations are, what the current state of affairs are, why we should be concerned. And as I'm doing this, go ahead and you can sign on to this letter at this time. To give you a little bit of background, the letter addresses some of the issues that we're facing today. And you may have heard about this fiscal cliff that we're currently facing. This is a clever cartoon from Christopher Wayant showing Congress ready to push America off the fiscal cliff. The fiscal cliff involves taxes, the Bush era tax cuts, it involves a number of different things. But the important thing on this fiscal cliff that we're going to be talking about today are sequestration. Now, you may not have heard of the word sequestration before, so what are sequestration? Sequestration were really a tool that was set in place in order to try to get Congress to act. And essentially what it is, is it's an act. It's an act that just chops the budget by approximately 10%. Now, where did this come from? Where did this act originate from? It started when we realized that the national debt was becoming too large. Here is a graph from the Congressional Budget Office. The most likely path in the future is the alternative fiscal scenarios path. So as you see, in the last couple years, the national debt as a percentage of GDP continued to rise up to about 60, 70 percent by 2010. And it's slated to come up to about 187 percent by 2035, which is unsustainable. Congress realized this and said, okay, we better do something about this. We cannot let this happen. Let's passed the Budget Control Act. And this was part of the debt limit showdown that Megan was talking about earlier. So the Budget Control Act did a couple different things. One, it set a top line spending number. So the amount of discretionary spending that Congress is allowed is capped under the Budget Control Act, which means that in the next 10 years, the top line spending will go down. The other thing that the Budget Control Act did is it said if Congress could not reach an agreement about cutting the deficit by a certain amount, then there would be imposed mandatory budget cuts. So whatever Congress would hope to spend in the year 2013, sequestration would cut science funding in, in January of 2013. And for any, uh, any spending accounts, any non-defense discretionary spending accounts would be cut by 9%, and any defense spending accounts would be cut by 12% in January 2013. This is not part of the budget planning process or anything along those lines. This is just in the middle of the fiscal year an act to all budgets. Mandated spending under the Budget Control Act would not be cut. So this is only the discretionary spending. Now, the important question here is what is the real world effect that these sequestrations or mandated cuts would have on you? NSF predicts about a $600 million cut. This means that NSF would have to cut grants awarded by anywhere from 500 to 1,500 grants. They haven't done a full analysis yet. Uh, Jeff Resents from the Office of Management and Budget says 1,500 grants per year. This would equate to 14,000 jobs fewer, which means that if you're an undergrad, when you are applying to graduate school, it might be harder for you to find a professor who'd be able to support your research. Or when you're a graduate student and you're looking for postdocs, there might be fewer postdocs. Uh, NASA predicts a $350 million cut. This would mean cuts to grants and not pursuing per proposed programs. The Department of Energy Office of Science would have an approximate $320 million cut. And if you include some of their other research agencies in the Department of Energy, it'd grow to about a $450 million cut. And NIH, 
since my background is in biophysics, predict a $3 billion cut, that means that the number of grants that they award would be cut by about a quarter or anywhere from 2,100 to 2,600 fewer grants. This, the numbers that I've seen, would equate to about 35,000 fewer jobs, which is really, really significant. These grants that, or the federal funding that would be cut, they, this funding goes towards supporting research opportunities for undergraduates. It helps support graduate students, allowing them to do the research necessary to earn their degree. Grants pay postdoc salaries. Uh, and federal investment supports facilities and equipment. There are fears that facilities will have to be shut down with sequestration, that there is going to be a squeezing of the supply chain. So if postdocs can't find jobs as professors, then they're going to stay in the postdoc position which means there'll be fewer postdoc positions opening up, which means fewer graduate students will be able to find a postdoc position, which means that then that'll squeeze funding at that level and just so on and so forth, all the way through to any undergraduate research opportunity. Now, there are things that Congress can do to avoid sequestration. There have been plans that Congress has previously discussed that would avoid sequestration, that would cut the deficit, that would cut the national debt. One of the plans that we mentioned in this letter, as you guys are reading it over, is the Bull-Simpson plan. The Bull-Simpson committee, which if you look at the bottom of the letter, there's a glossary and you can learn more about it there. Uh, the Bull Simpson Committee released a plan that would have reduced U.S. public debt, not just reducing the rate of increase of that debt, which is what the Budget Control Act does. It considered reforms to entitlement programs, which is critical because entitlement program, the mandatory spending comprises the majority of government spending, and it would have avoided sequestration. So these mandatory, this, this act that's coming in January of 2013 would have been avoided. Now, Congress still has time to act. Whether or not they will depends in large part upon what they hear from their constituents. Do they hear from their constituents, yes, we want you to stand up and stand by these values and not compromise, or do they hear, we want you to look to do a, and some sort of a compromise in order to avoid this fiscal cliff? And that's what the letter from the letter that we're asking you to sign supports. It supports Congress compromising and looking for a bipartisan path forward to avoid these sequestrations. Now, at this point, uh, go ahead and click on this link if you haven't done so already. We're trying here to not only have physics students sign on to this letter, but we're also partnering with other professional societies, such as some of them that Megan mentioned earlier, like. Uh, IEEE or AGU, and we're working on partnering with them so that way students from all sorts of different disciplines can have their voice heard about what they feel the impact of sequestrations would be on them and that they hope that Congress will look for a way to avoid falling off the fiscal cliff. If you're a graduate student, feel free to bring this to your next graduate student meeting and share it with some of your other graduate students. If you're an undergrad and you're involved in SPS, then go ahead and bring this up in your SPS room or wherever you can meet with other undergraduates and urge them to sign this letter also. This is important that we get good representation, but it's also important just to let your voice be heard. And if you do have any further questions that maybe you don't feel entirely comfortable asking right now, you can always contact myself or Megan or John, I'm sure, where in order to ask any of these questions in the future, both about being involved or any other questions about the letter that we're asking you to sign or anything along those lines. Um, Tyler, can I bust in just one, one second and just uh point out to everybody that the link is actually also in your questions box and it should have a hyperlink so you should be able to click on that directly and go to the, the letter.
All right, so we will give all of you a minute to uh, check out the letter if you haven't already. And let's start to uh, look at questions. So if you have any questions, uh, make sure that you take time now to type them in. That way we can start to address them. So we had some previous questions regarding jobs and what the future outlook of jobs is and maybe how this might affect jobs in the future. Um, John, do you want to mention maybe some of the discussions that you had in the past with members of Congress about what the job outlook was? And then I can speak a little bit more on that question. Yeah, sure. Um, some of the things that when I went to when I went to Congress and I was talking to representatives, um, one of the things that really surprised them well, it was kind of a twofold thing. One is that most of the PhDs that are awarded in the physical sciences don't go to U.S. citizens, and two is that U.S. citizens themselves are sometimes being funded by overseas uh, governments. So I had had two years of my research being paid for by KAUST. Uh, while my stipend was being paid by the NSF. And a lot of times uh, we would see in the buses in Ithaca like little advertisements, that, hey, come finish your PhD at KAUST or come start your postdoc at KAUST. And um, so I would talk to the senators and congressmen's uh, staff, or sorry, the representatives and, and senators' staffers talking about you know, what, what kind of job outlook does this mean that younger people have if we have to worry about not having stable funding and looking for jobs overseas instead. And that was something that really resonated with them. And they were very concerned about the prospect of young US um, trained scientists, whether or not they were from, whether or not they're US citizens, but US trained scientists actually leaving for better opportunities abroad. So it's not something that they want to have happen, but it's definitely, you know, if there's not enough money to fund the sciences, then you, what choice do you have, right? So that's, Taylor has more. Yeah, I'm going to uh, jump on a point that you, you started to make here, John, is that jobs is foremost in Congress's mind right now. They're very concerned uh, how the economy is going is often the most important predictor of who's going to win an election. So Congress is very, very concerned. And for multiple reasons, they are then very interested in hearing from students about how students view what's going to happen with jobs because they know that, especially in sciences, engineering, that this is a group of future job creators. And the last thing that they want to have happen is for a student in, say, physics, to look at the funding situation and say, you know what, I see that I could get some other grants abroad and therefore I'm going to go move away, take my talent, you know, over there to co-opt a phrase and I'm going to start being a job creator over there. Um, this is for a number of reasons that Congress is very concerned about this, both for any technological innovations, for any job creation for any patent that the U.S. would be losing out on. They're very, very concerned about this. So the student voice is a very evocative voice, and Congress wants to listen. Congress wants to say, yes, yeah, we're going to be able to take care of the next generation of Americans. And when you go and you talk to Congress, they want to hear about what your concerns are so they can address those concerns. Uh, we have a question about uh, whether or not somebody who's not currently active in research yet should wait to advocate until they have some research under their belt, or if now would be a good time to start advocating. Uh, uh, Megan, do you want to talk about some of your advocacy experience? Because you have been involved in advocacy for quite a while, and if I remember correctly, you had started getting involved before you actually 
uh, had started research? Well, I had started research, but I hadn't, um, uh, basically I had just barely started in research in my PhD program, and that wasn't even the advisor that I stayed with. You don't need to be in a research group to advocate for this, uh, because you're not there to talk about your research. You're there to talk about the impact of science on society and how it impacts um, you as a scientist, not necessarily how it impacts, you know, whatever experiment that you're running. Um, if you want to get involved in it and you care about it, get involved with it whenever you want to. Um, I don't think you need to be like in a set research group yet, but I, I will say that uh, if you're in a PhD program, uh, once you do get really involved in research, um, remember that uh, you're going to have to manage your time uh, between the two. Uh, so uh, it, it might be a little harder actually once you really get involved in research to be very involved in policy, but I mean, I think I'm pretty involved, and I'm I'm starting my fifth year of grad school, and so no. I, basically, the point is no. I don't think you need to wait. If you care, go ahead and do it, uh, and just you know make make sure to manage your time so you don't so you don't overcommit to things. I guess. <laughs> okay. So yeah, if you are considering whether or not to wait or not. Get involved. Sign the letter now. You don't have to be a graduate student full on, you know, in your research project in order to speak out about these issues. As an undergraduate who may be considering grad school in the future, maybe considering industry, that that you know you're not entirely sure what to do. This still has potential effect on your future. So certainly get involved, sign the letter now, and you know consider other opportunities in the future to get involved. Um, to play off of that question a little bit, Megan and John, they, maybe both of you can talk about this a little bit. Do you think that being involved in this has made you a better graduate student? Uh, John, why don't you talk about it first? Oh, a better graduate student. That's tough, I think. Um, as a better graduate student, I would say, um, I think, let's see, I think so, but I'm trying to think of like a really good concrete reason. I think it's good in, while you're in graduate school to realize uh, every once in a while come up for air from your, <laughs> from your project. Um, a lot of times, a lot of graduate students will get super into, into their research to the point where they, um, really like when they're giving a presentation or they're considering uh, things that's slightly external to the research, um, if there's not a plot that describes what's going on, then the presentation suffers. And I think it's good to step back and look at what's the broader reason? Why am I doing this science? Well, I like the science. I think this is an important question, but how does this relate to society? And I, and I really think that being able to talk to government officials really helps you be uh, able, like, makes you more able to take your project and um, condense it in a, in a way that everybody can understand that's not just your advisor or not just the people in your lab or the people who are deeply involved in your field. And that's important when you're talking to society. So it makes you function better in society, and I think by proxy that that makes you a better graduate student. Yeah, I I will echo that. Um, in fact, I, I think one of the more, I guess, logistical benefits to doing to doing this is that it does force you to be able to manage your time a little better. Because if you want, when you're actually a professional, you're going to have to be doing your job, and you have service tasks to deal to to do. And um, if you want to be able to um, kind of contribute to society in more with more than just your experiments, then being involved in something like this really, really, um, really helps. Like for me, for example, it's it's really kind of helped me figure out more about career options that I would prefer over others, and uh, it's it's helped me just meet a broader range of scientists that I might not have met otherwise, and 
it really has helped me be able to, I think I mentioned this during my part of the talk, be able to see where I fit in to society and where, where uh, science fits in in general. Yeah, I was very curious kind of to hear what both of you would say. I know at the professional academic uh, research scientist level that there have been pop population-wide studies done of scientists at that level where they examined how uh, often scientists engage in public outreach and then compared that to their bibliometric, which is essentially how often they publish, how often the papers that they publish are cited. And what they found was scientists who took a little bit of time away just from being in the lab all day long and did engage in some degree of public outreach had higher bibliometrics. They, their papers were cited more often. They published papers more frequently. And they found in the engineering field, at the very least, that this was causally related with promotion. So hey, that's not so bad. <laughs> um, we have a question also about whether or not this would be appropriate to share on LinkedIn with other physics major friends. Absolutely. Feel free to share this with other friends of yours. Have them sign on. Have them take a look at it. The webinar itself will be archived. And they can certainly check out the webinar later if they're curious for some more information about what sequestrations are, how that might affect grants in their future, to hear Megan and John's story. So if you're interested in sharing this on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, absolutely feel free. We'd love to have you guys be the advocates and have you guys be the voices for physics and for science. Uh, Megan, one of the things that you mentioned, and I'm wondering if you can expound on this a little bit, is you said that oftentimes you speak with a staffer, mm -hmm. and in your opinion, uh, is speaking with that staffer something that's really worth your time, and are they really the right people to speak to? Uh, yeah, 100%, uh, because the staffers are the ones who get information together, and they help inform their the senator or representative on uh, how to make a decision and uh, basically they they are the ground level people and they're the ones who give advice to the congressman. Um, speaking with the representative is is also I mean it's great it's 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 a little bit more impressive to talk to them I think but they have a half a million things going on they talk to so many people during the day um, that you know they they're going to remember you and if you make an impact on them they'll definitely remember you but speaking with the staffer i think it's you know it's it's their job to know what you're talking about there i feel like your information is going to definitely be um, relayed effectively and brought together with information that other people have brought around so speaking with the staffer isn't like bad you're not being written off you're not, um, I put it this way, it's not a lesser meeting to meet with a staffer because, you know, you're basically talking to that part of the, that, I mean, let me put it this way. For the congressional office, the congressman is in charge of that office, but all of his information comes from the staffers. <laughs> so, yeah, the staffers are definitely the people that you want to talk to. So we have a couple uh, quick questions that I'll address. One of them is whether or not there's a document with some simple talking points about this issue available for distribution. Uh, on the web page of the letter itself, there is the glossary about what sequestrations are, and there's some more information there. Uh, APS also has our, poli our policy page, and under our policy page, we have a lot of different information there. We have information about current issues in the budget. We have information 
about how to conduct a successful meeting with your representative. We have a lot of different things there, so feel free to check out that page. And also, absolutely feel free to give me a call, drop me an email, anything like that. I'm always happy to answer any questions and to help you guys speak out for yourself about the issues that are important to you. And then we have another question, which is interesting, about uh, in, the, in the letter, we mentioned the Bull Simpson Committee and the Bull Simpson Plan. Now, is that really the correct thing to, to talk about here? Because Congress looked at Bull Simpson, it got a majority of the vote in the committee, but did not eventually get passed out in order for Congress to give it full consideration. And so why is it that we mentioned Bull Simpson? The reason that we mentioned Bull Simpson is we mention it as a reference to a bipartisan plan and we're not necessarily saying, Congress, please look back at Bull Simpson and consider reviving this and choose that as your path forward. What we're trying to say is there have been bipartisan plans put forth in order to avoid this fiscal cliff. And for instance, one of those bipartisan plans was Bull Simpson, which addressed the issue of mandatory spending. So we ask that Congress consider a bipartisan plan to move forward. Now, whether that's a Bull Simpson plan or whether that's another bipartisan plan, we're hoping that Congress will consider working together, compromising, and avoiding this fiscal cliff that currently faces us. Now, uh, another question and hopefully Megan and John can both kind of talk about this a little bit in terms of their preparation, is do you need to have a background in science policy and political science in order to address these issues? Uh, so um, Megan and John, do you each want to maybe mention a little bit about your preparation coming into the congressional visit days and whether or not you need a background in science policy Sure. in order to fully understand these issues and get involved? Um, so quite honestly, uh, no, you, you don't. Um, and I guess I could actually just leave it at that, but I could, I could explain how, how little congressional anything, any preparation whatsoever I had, um, which was absolutely none. Um, but then, so the only preparation that I had like formally was after I had decided that I wanted to do this, um, I contact or the APS contacted me with a few pieces of paper based up basically like this is what this is uh, here's the piece of paper that you're going to hand to your congressman. This is called the ask, and it's basically um, like lingo for the piece of paper that you're going to give, and they train you like maybe three hours on if you want to say, let's talk about basic research. You don't call it basic research. You call it early stage research and things like that. But in terms of a background in, in uh, policy advocacy, no, you don't need that at all. Um, you really just need to want to do it. If you, if you think that you can go in with one or two other people into a, a congressman's office um, with, with coaching beforehand on how to properly address the, your concerns, um, then it's great. Then they, they really want to hear from you because you're not somebody who's trained in politics. Like you, you're, you are essentially purely someone they represent and getting word from you who's, who's not trained in politics and you know an advanced scientist or an aspiring advanced scientist um, that's that's more important to them, I would think. You probably have an advantage by not having any political background. Yeah, I uh, I I would agree with that. Um, it might seem intimidating, be like, oh no, I don't have any background in this. I'm only gonna get some training and then be thrown in there. But honestly, your your first few meetings are usually with a group of people, and you get comfortable seeing how other people talk, and you start to just chime in where you think is appropriate. And after a couple meetings, um, you'll feel pretty comfortable just talking on your own. Um, I mean, my third meeting, I think I was by myself, and I was pretty comfortable. And um, 
quite honestly, I, I'm not. It, I'm not the type of person who likes going into something without practicing it a lot. So, uh, yeah, no, you don't, you don't need to come in with any experience. They'll tell you what the current issue is. They'll tell you things to do and not to do. And you won't be expected to just uh, walk in there by yourself and change, change government completely on your own or anything. <laughs> and I'll jump in and I'll say that as a student, uh, you have all the background that you need. You're concerned about your future, and that's the background to go in to meet with a representative or to sign a letter or to interact with them in some way. And only 2% of the population ever gets in touch with their representative. And we need to be part of that 2% because as Blake opened up with, Congress was considering cuts, and because they heard from us, not only did they not make further cuts than what they were considering in the first place, but they reversed the cuts that they were originally considering. So when Congress does hear from that small 2%, then it really does make a difference. And as concerned students, that's all the background that you need. Uh, there is a question earlier about having seen us at the APS meetings, the APS March meeting, the APS, the national APS meetings. Uh, I wanted to mention that this is something that has to be done really every year. We have to make sure that we interact with Congress every year. Um, that Congress, they have staff, and that staff turns over. Congress. Our congressmen get elected, and new Congress people are coming in all the time. New senators are coming in. So making sure that every year when the budget comes up, when there's a new congressperson, they hear from us is incredibly important. And at the national meetings, when we're standing there in our suits, which looks kind of funny at a meeting of physicists standing around in a suit, uh, we're there often working to allow physicists to reach out to Congress every year because every year it's a new issue and every year it's important to get a hold of them. Um, also, John, did you want to say something about this staffer question? Uh, yeah, I could answer that. Um, so there was a question asking how you can meet your congressional staffers. And um, the way I found the easiest is um, usually it's it's – it's very easy to meet with your congressional staffers um, that are representative of your state and district. So what you have to do is look up who your district representative is. Um, usually you can go to the house, house.gov, I think, the government website for the House of Representatives, and you can type in your address, and it will give you um, the people who represent you. Um, and you actually just email them with a request to meet with um, either meet you talk about the meeting that you want to do. Say, I, you know, I want to discuss the um, the next year's budget for uh, the research sciences, or you specifically say, I want to meet with a science staffer or somebody who's involved with science policy, and uh, you specify a date, and you usually get a 15-minute time slot, and uh, it's pr it's pretty easy. Given that you're a constituent, if you're not a constituent, sometimes it's a little harder. Sometimes they don't have time because uh, they're meeting with other constituents. All right. I think that that's about the time that we have for questions right now. And as we sign off from this, go ahead right now, take a look at the letter, sign it, share it with all your friends on LinkedIn, on Facebook, as we mentioned before, and take this opportunity to have your voice be heard. Crystal? All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Tyler, and to Slake and John and Megan. Great um, presentation. A lot of really, really excellent questions. Um, like I said, but, but if there are remaining questions, we do apologize if we did not get to them today. Um, but uh, for those who are signing off now, we, we do welcome you to follow up with the speakers by sending an email. You can either email webinars at APS.org, or you can email Tyler at the address that's actually on your screen. And we, you know, if you email webinars, we'll forward your questions to the speakers for comments. 
slides of the presentation will be made available on the main page for today's webinar, uh, which I actually sent out earlier in the questions box. Um, and you should also be directed there at the end of today's broadcast. Also, a recording of today's webinar will appear on this main webinar page for this, this presentation. We do ask that you please allow 24 hours for upload of that video. You will also receive an email from us or from GoToWebinar actually containing a link to the recording of today's presentation. Lastly, in order to help APS continue to develop quality webinar presentations, please help us by taking a moment to complete the short survey as you exit the webinar today. And uh, I guess that's all I have uh, wraps up today's event, and we hope that you'll join us again next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.